Lizzie Borden, bottom of page 173, day 4, Thursday, June 8, 1893. At the calling of Alice Russell's name, Lizzie's face went livid. She straightened up in her chair and watched the door. One paper said Alice looked everywhere, but as Lizzie, as she walked in, another reported that her pale blue eyes blazed at the sight of her old friend in the prisoner's dock. Extremely trim in her manner, the bombastic columnist Joe Howard told his readers, Ms. Russell holds her mouth as though prisms and prunes were in its most frequent utterances. As she testified, he noted that with crossed arms, she emphasizes her replies with little taps, with a bombazine fan. Moody began with Lizzie's Wednesday night visit to Alice's house. Alice, who at the preliminary hearing had been asked by a frustrated Knowlton, do you remember anything that took place at all? Now recalled enough of Lizzie's forebodings to cover five pages of stenographer's note paper. Her memory of the day of the murder was had not improved. However, I cannot tell it in order, for it is very disconnected, she says. I remember very little of it, but Alice distinctly remembered Lizzie standing by the stove Sunday morning, tearing up a dress. It was a cheap cotton dress, a light blue Bedford cord with a small dark figure printed on it. The hem was soiled. Lizzie had held the edge out for Alice to see, and when she saw it, uh, saw of it was not bloodstained. Alice Russell was empathetic on that point. Alice also made it clear that she had not actually seen Lizzie burn the dress. She heard Lizzie say that she was going to do it, saw her tearing a portion of it up, and saw another piece of it on the shelf in the cupboard. That was all. Nevertheless, the implication was obvious. Lizzie Borden had not turned over the right dress to the police. That Bedford Court, the prosecution alleged, was the reason no one from Bridget to the neighbors to the police had seen one speck of blood on Lizzie Borden from the instant the crime had was discovered. She somehow managed to keep it hidden during the searches, then burned it Sunday morning in plain view of the officer standing guard in the yard outside. Could Lizzie Borden have pulled off something so brazen with such a crucial piece of evidence? Was that blue Bedford cord, in fact, the same dress she had worn Thursday morning? Hard to tell. The dress Lizzie provided to the police apparently had not survived. Only a handful of people had seen what Lizzie was wearing before she changed into her pink and white striped wrapper. And since none of them realized at the time that it would become a vital piece of evidence, their attempts to describe it ten months later did not paint a vivid, much less consistent picture. Describing Lizzie's dress, Bridget Sullivan. I couldn't tell what dress the girl had on. It was Churchill. It looked like a light blue and white groundwork. It seemed like calico or, cam- calico or cambric. It had a light blue and white groundwork with a navy blue diamond printed on it. Alice was, uh, it was loosely here and it's a part of the bosom. When I started to unloosen them, that is the only thing about the dress I noticed. Dr. Broder, it was an ordinary, unattractive, common dress that I did not notice specific, especially. Charles Sawyer. I couldn't tell you the colors as I know of. Inspector Patrick Daughtry. I thought she was a light blue dress with a bosom in the waist or something like a bosom. I thought there was a small figure in the dress, a little spot-like. Miss Churchill's description was far and away the most specific, but her credibility eroded it under Governor Robinson's cross-examination when she guessed that Bridget was wearing a light calico dress. Bridget Sullivan's dress that day had been a dark indigo blue with a white clover leaf. Alice Russell's dress was a complete blank to her. Bridget's dress also brought Inspector Daugherty's power of observation into question when he called it kind of brown. That was easy enough to explain. Patrick Daugherty was colorblind. At the preliminary hearing, when asked to point out a garment or object with the same shade of blue as Lizzie Warden's dress, Daugherty had selected a white necktie. Dr. Bowen's wife had been there, too, but her recollections were a mess. At one of the earlier proceedings, she apparently testified to a white dress with a waist with blue material, a white spray running right through it. At the trial, it became a dark dress with a round figure of flower on the waist. Realizing the discrepancy, Nelson asked, It's not a spray that is on the dress? I should not. I should say not, Miss Bowen answered. I did not mean a dress with any white, she said, but dark blue and dress with a blouse and had that figure in it. She was not sure whether the print was a figure or a spray. Blouses, waist, and wrappers. The government called a waist had nothing to do with a woman's waistline. It was short for a shirt waist. The bodice of two-piece dress, a loose bodice was called a blouse waist or a bosom, while a tight-fitting one was known as a basque. Wrappers, though they were found all the world like bathrobes, were simply form-fitting house dresses with a front closure and a ribbon or sash to cinch the waistline. Lizzie herself had said nothing about a print, describing the dress only as navy blue, sort of bengalanine or India silk skirt with a navy blue blouse. 
Each time a witness was called, the evidence swung from one side to the other. It did not help that Lizzie Borden owned no less than eight blue dresses, nor that the attorneys doing the questioning were three-quarters inept when it came to the style and terminology of the ladies' fashions. Every woman in court laughed at Moody's and Milton's attempt to probably lay out Lizzie's Bengal silk for the witness to examine, for the two men could not find the waistline. But even the ladies were occasionally lost. Miss Churchill was unfamiliar with Bedford Court material, so... <clears throat> she could not say whether the dress she remembered from Thursday morning was made of Bedford Court or not. I thought it was a cotton dress of some kind, she said, not realizing that Lizzie Bedford Court was cotton. Yet Alice Russell testified that she had seen the Bedford Court exactly twice, first when it was new, then the Sunday after the homicide, and never again in between. Bengaline silk and Bedford Court. One sounds like silk, the other corduroy. Neither is quite what it seems. Bengaline offers a sort of silk for a fraction of the cost. By weaving fine silk threads around strands of wool, cotton, or, in Lizzie Borden's case, linen, the combination results in a ribbed fabric with a silken sheen. Bedford cord is also ribbed and relatively inexpensive, but lacks both the sheen of bengaline and the velvety texture of corduroy. Out of seven witnesses, only Miss Borden recognized the navy blue Beglani dress displayed by the prosecution as the one Lizzie Borden had worn Thursday morning. It was a jury's nightmare. Regardless of what Lizzie's dress looked like, the question of how she could have kept the police from finding it remained. The prosecution called Assistant Marshal John Fleet to the stand to answer to that. It would be unfamiliar to say that an initial search on Thursday, August 4th, had been cursory. Mr. Moody's questioning showed that Fleet and his fellow officers had been all over the Borden property during the course of the day of the first day, and they looked everywhere. The first policeman dispatched to 92nd Street on August 4th, Officer George Allen, had opened the kitchen cupboards with Alice Russell, eventually saw the Bedford Court before he returned to the station for backup. The issue was a matter of focus. The officers were making a broad sweep of the house, looking for the weapon, the criminal item so glaring they couldn't be called clues. So when Fleet asked Lizzie to unlock the closed press upstairs, she had no expectation of finding anything and no intention of pausing to examine every garment right there and then and there. The assistant marshal was only covering his bases, and he was up front about it on the witness stand. How much of an inspection or search did you make in the room at that time? Mr. Moody asked. We just looked over the clothing, looked round the floor, and up on the shelf. We did not search very closely. It was... Not an unreasonable approach, but to hear Governor Robinson's cross-examination, it sounded as though the police had done no more than look under the beds for the boogeyman. A whole new side of Robinson emerged to deal with the assistant marshal. The fatherly gentleman made himself irritable, stern, and impatient, and within five minutes he was under flea skin. Governor Robinson treaded a delicate line, though. He needed to show it was possible for the police to have overlooked the Bedford Accord, but he needed to do it in exactly the right way. Make the police appear incompetent and Robinson risked le leaving room for the jury to believe Lizzie could have successfully hidden the dress from the officers. Fleet made it almost too easy. Question, would you have seen any paint the way you looked? I don't think that I should. Would you have been seen any blood the way you looked? Now, without, if not, without it was on the outside right before my eyes, I didn't look at them close enough to notice. Robinson did not bother with Fleet about the search he'd conducted of the closed press of the state officer Seaver on Saturday, August 6. He would wait until Seaver himself took the stand two days later to fully demolish the prosecution's allegation that the Bedford Court had never been in the closed press. By the time the ex-governor was done, it did not matter that Seaver had answered no when Mr. Moody asked Point Blank, did you see a light blue dress, diamond spots upon it, and paint around the bottom of the dress and on its front? Robinson and made it painfully clear the policemen had been so focused on looking specifically for blood, they noticed almost nothing else about the dresses themselves. Officer Seaver could not tell whether he had seen a dress made of Sh Shaleen, Deline, or Alpaca, much less a Bedford cord. If he had, he wouldn't have known because he didn't recognize the different fabrics. By now, Lizzie Borden's pink and white striped wrapper was known the world over, yet he could not say whether he had seen a pink dress. According to Emma Borden's inventory, she and her sister owned ten blue dresses between them, but Seaver could also could not say whether there were any blue dresses. All he remembered for certain were one or two black ones and wool or silk. And here Lizzie Borden shook her head and whispered to her lawyer she had no black silk. For a moment he even thought maybe Lizzie was wearing the blue Bedford cord the day of the search, then changed his mind. Was you actually looking after that blue dress at all? Robinson asked. No, sir, Officer Seaver admitted.